Abigail, first, yeah, you know, what got you? How did you end up working in TV? Because it wasn't well, that wasn't your plan, was it? Particular. Well, it kind of was. It kind of yeah. was. Well, it kind of was, yeah. but it wasn't in the role that I'm doing now. Okay, yeah. So, so when so I was younger, I wanted to work in two industries. I wanted to work in either fashion as a fashion designer, or television. Kind of wasn't really sure. I didn't know the terminology when I was growing up, but probably more of a producer. That, that was kind of the role I was looking at. Um, and I wanted to go into those industries because I thought they were glamorous. And they're not. It's a fair assumption, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's fair. It looks glamorous, <laughs> but they're, they're not particularly glamorous until you get the dizzy heights. But for the, you know, when you're starting out, it's not very glamorous at all. And I, so that's what I wanted to do when I was younger. And then when I told my mum, she was like, that's not a career. So you're going to go to university and you're going to become a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant because she was a nurse and uh, my dad was an accountant and they just weren't part of that world. Sure. And I don't even know where I got it from because nobody I knew. The only thing I... Actually, it's really funny because the only thing I can think of... when I, My mum was a midwife and she used to do some private shifts and she would talk about the kind of... She worked in like Harley Street and she worked in some other big private... Um, uh, clinics and hospitals yeah. uh, in West, in North London, North West London, where I, I grew up, and she used to talk about the celebrities that used to come in, right, right. and I can only think that it was because she would say, "Oh, she would name drop these people," <laughs> and I can only think that's the only thing that what I thought drew it sounds you to that world because I have yeah. n- I have no relations, nobody right. I know works in television okay. or fashion, so I don't know. Other than that, I can't actually think of why I decided that that was the thing for me. But yeah, that's kind of how I started. Yeah. Or, or but you I didn't start straight away. I did didn't. You? Yeah. No. So, what, so yeah. So just so, talk us through the beginning a little um, bit. I did my A look. Oh, I try not to swear, but I can't help swearing. Don't worry about swearing. We'll cut out the swearing. So Fuck it's all right. <laughs> so I'll try not to. <laughs> um, yeah. So I did my my uh, A levels, and they weren't particularly brilliant. I, for me. Edu- well, school was a bit of a social event. I went there because I knew where my friends were going to be in the morning, and then we would all bunk off in the afternoon. So that was for me. That was it. Like, sure? I wasn't really was I wasn't really challenged particularly at school. I think they all kind of I moved schools or we, the schools merged, and I w- they just didn't really think much of me. So I really didn't think much of them. And um, <coughs> so when I was growing up, I. I did my A-levels, they weren't particularly great. My mum said I had to go to university. I got on a politics degree course, went through clearing, didn't get a grant. Thought I'll do it for a year, earn some money, and then go back to university and finish my degree. At the time, while I was doing that, I was a Saturday girl in a shop. And I left after a year, turned my Saturday job into a full-time retail job, and loved it and never went back to do my, finish my degree. Um, and then loads of, there's lots of different bits of the story, but the most significant one was my area manager basically said to me, Abigail, by the time you're 30, you'll have your own shop on Oxford Street. And I just was like, no, I don't want to fold shirts for the rest of my life. Because I just sure, thought, sure. You know, I love the job, and yeah. if that's what you want to do, it's brilliant. But I just knew that I needed to do something different. So... Long story short, I ended up sort of changing, getting out of that and getting into fashion. And so originally I was a, I started off as an intern and I stayed there five years and I ended up running um, a division of select models. And it was brilliant. I loved it, learned a lot about rights and negotiation and all that kind of stuff, but still felt there was something that was missing. And what so was that? What was the thing? What, 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 did I feel like? what was the thing that was missing? Being creative, because as an agent, it was my job to get the girls, women, their jobs. Sure. But in terms of my creativity, went as as much as I would get a brief from a client of the kind of person they wanted, and I would literally pick cars of the girls I thought could be right for it and put them in an envelope, and the bike would take them off, and then they'll decide who they wanted. That was right, as creative okay. as that job was, really. Yeah. Every now and again, I might do a shoot, but it wasn't that big um so i didn't really feel like i was doing anything particularly creative mm-hmm. i was in a creative world sure. but i personally wasn't creative right yeah and i felt like i needed to do something about that so i decided i would try television before i quit my head got too old and um it came about because one of my friends who was not a presenter got asked to present a show for a very small digital tv channel and she knew that I wanted to get into TV, and mm-hmm. so she asked me to come and just support her, you know, a bit of moral support, just turn up, and I did. 
And because I, I also wanted to see how they did it, because I'd never really been on a sure. set or been yeah. in a studio. So I wanted to have an idea. So I went to support her. And um, while she was doing her filming, I ended up sitting at a table with this woman and just like asking loads of questions. And she was saying, well, how, how are you here? How do you know oh, my friend Fontella? And I was like, oh, just coming, you know, I worked in fashion. I'm not doing anything at the moment. I want to try and get into television. And she, I didn't realize she was the channel controller at the time. And so she then invited me to be an intern. So I did, I was an intern for a month. And it went from there. What to, kinds of things were you doing as an intern? Uh, so it was specifically I was doing. Um, I was an acquisitions intern. So acquisitions is where you get the content in for the channel. So that's mm -hmm. where they buy the shows as opposed to producing the stuff okay. for themselves. Yeah. So they were, and it was a very specific kind of um, channel. It was very social um, documentary led, and they would get content from anybody. So who, as long as the quality obviously was good, so they would get stuff from BBC, ITV, mm -hmm. Channel Four, but they would also get filmmakers who would come up with an idea that they really wanted to get onto broadcast and they would come to us. We, we couldn't, they couldn't pay, we couldn't pay them, right, but they right. got their first broadcast cre credit. So right, it was, okay. that was the transaction. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I did that for a month and then a job came up as a rights assistant and that was to help clear the rights to get the programmes onto the channel. But no one, would, no one told me about the job and they wouldn't really, they weren't mentioning it, but I was like, I'm an intern, I'm just getting my expenses, I need a job. And I found out they didn't want to give me the job or didn't want to offer the, the interview for the job because they thought, oh, she's worked in fashion, you know, she's been on a big salary, she's not gonna want it. And I was just like, I want a job. I don't care, I just want to, I want to earn money, I want a job. So I forced them to give me an interview. Well, you say forced them. Well, I literally said, you are, you have to, I'm like, why can't I, just why can't I apply? Right. It's okay. like, you can't, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah, They're yeah. like, you there wasn't there no guns involved. Really. No, 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 okay. no, not that, yeah, not that bad. Um, but I just said, look, why can't I, why can't I apply? And they were like, well, you've just done this massive job and why would you want to do this? And you know, you should be out there doing stuff. And I said, well, I just want to learn and I'm quite happy to do this. So just give me the opportunity. Right. So um, they, they agreed, and then I saw the other person. I saw the other person because she was also working in the office, who was applying for that job. And when I saw her, I was like, "That job's mine. <laughs> that job is mine." <laughs> I don't care what anyone says. That job is mine, <laughs> and I got the job, and it was brilliant. <laughs> but it was only, and the thing is, I was stressing out really badly about wanting this job. I'm a bit of a control freak because um, it was only for, it was only for three months. The job right, was only for three right, months. Okay. I was like, "I want that. Jo that job is mine." And I did it, and then just as I was coming towards the end of it, my line manager left, so I got promoted into her job. Right. And now I was staff, and then it was, it was brilliant. It was great fun. I learned lots about how a small digital TV channel works. It was brilliant, because so, we were so small, budgets were tiny, you had to do everything. So I would acquire programs, and then because I knew I wanted so to. When you say acquire programs, what literally what? So that literally, mean? I would go to, mm. I might go to a festival and see something that I liked, right. a short film, and think, you know, I'll get in touch with the director and say, do you want to broadcast it? Right. Okay. And okay. you know, depending on the, you know what they were like and how you could do business with them, they would say yes. For the most part, they would say yes because sure. a lot there isn't really, and that's my problem sometimes with television at the moment is there isn't really an outlet for people who who produced their own stuff, mm -hmm. for them to then go and show it on national television. And sure. this channel, although it was small, was a national channel. And so people could take that as a credit and say, look, I produced something, it's gone on this channel. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that was the only thing I could give them. Um, so yeah, that's what I was doing. But what I then used to do is, with some of those um, directors' um, shows and some of the stuff we used to get from other broadcasters, I would um, do little packages around them. So we'd have like a mental health season. Right. And I would go off and, with a like, very small skeleton crew, do a like, three-minute promo or right, little okay. show that would yeah. introduce or talk yeah. to other people. So it was packaged as a season. Right. So we kind of punched really above our weight in terms of trying to make the content more than just getting a programme on, putting it on television and forgetting about it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I used to do. So, and then the, the woman who actually first gave me the, the um, internship, she basically there was a, she basically said to me Abigail you've got to decide do you want to do acquisitions because she, she was brilliant she was a mentor so she said well you're not going to be here for the rest of your life it's a very small channel you could go to other channels but do you want to do acquisitions or do you want to be a producer and I was like 
I want to be a producer. And she said, well, you've got to make that decision now because it's going to affect you. Right. And so she basically said, if you want to be a producer, we can train you and we'll give you a pay rise. And it was only like, well, I say any grand, any money is good money, but yeah. it was a grand more. And she said, if you want to be a producer, it's this. And if you want to be at like, state acquisitions, this is the rate you're on at the moment. And I was like, kind of tempted just by like, a little bit of money. I was like, no, you know what? I'm going to stick with acquisitions. And I don't know why. Well, yeah, I was going to say, why? I don't know <laughs> why, but just something. Here you are, more money doing what you want to do. Yeah. Oh, no, it's all right. I think I because I knew, I knew how it, the channel ran, really. So she mm. was doing high level mm. stuff and partnerships, but I was doing the on the ground stuff. So right. I knew what had to be done right. to get a program onto air. And I kind of thought, you know what? She's not going to know if I produce any little the, the stuff I was doing before. She's not really going to know, right, okay. and she's not really she will care, but as long as something's on there, she's not going to interfere. Yeah. So I was like, no, it's fine. I'm going to be acquisitions. She was a bit like, All right, okay, fine. And then a couple of months later, she left, and there was another another direct um, managing editor came in, and he saw that I was producing, and it was just like, okay, that's what she that's her job. That's what she does. <laughs> right, okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's very fortuitous. It wasn't supposed to happen that way, right. but it did, and then. I had um, an exec producer came in and she, she was great, but she had, they had too much work. We had too much stuff to do. And so she, her way of getting out of talking to people or doing meetings or be, doing viewings was she would say, talk, and at the time I was an acquisitions producer, she would email people, CC me in and go, talk to our, acquis our head of acquisitions. <laughs> so all of a sudden I was like head of acquisitions, <laughs> but they weren't paying me. But I, so I changed my my signature or my thing and basically call myself head of acquisitions. And then right. everyone in the company called myself, called me called, head, called of, head of acquisitions. And that was my way of just thinking I could just push it just a little bit more. And then sh that person left. Right. And then the other uh, manager just left and somebody else came in and I was like, I'm doing this job and no one's paying me. So then they had to pay me as a head of acquisitions. Right, and I was okay. like, yes. Good. Yeah, well because you kind of have to, because you kind of have to, and I think you'll realise that in your career, depending on what you have to do, mm. you, it, as long as you're not doing anything too offensive, you can. I I would suggest try to be a little bit cheeky, but be on the right side of cheeky. cheeky. Sure. Yeah. And I think you can get cheeky away. Cheeky, but not taking the piss. Don't take the piss. Yeah. yeah, but, but cheeky. be yeah. be cheeky because you. I think yeah. you just you kind of have to, to yeah. because also. Unless you have like real good mentors, you're going to have to find a lot out yourself and you'll learn a lot about yourself as well as the industry. And my way of doing that was going, OK, I don't know if I can try this, I'll try it. And if it works, yeah. it works. If it doesn't, sure. it doesn't. Yeah. But that's my way of just being a bit cheeky. So I've always got that element of being a bit cheeky. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And so how long were you there for then? So I, so I was there for in total for five and a half years. So after I was and now head of acquisitions, I got a new boss and when he, and this is, so I did, I do moan. So he came in and was going around all the staff saying what they should change and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this. And then like two weeks later, he went around the whole staff and was asking them and he was basically wanted to find out if he could change this kind of channel and make it a bit more um, noticeable in the kind of, you know, 400 channels that we have in this sure. world. And like two weeks later, he presented this report and said, oh yeah, there's gonna be some changes. And then he took us all off and had different meetings with us. And he then came back and said, I want you to run the channel. So I ended up being the manager. He was director of the channel and they had this company I worked for, they had a production arm. So he then basically said, I want you to be managing editor, so you're gonna run the channel. So right. I ended up running the Great. channel for a year and a half. Right. And that was brilliant. Um, so in total, I was there from being an intern to running it for about five and a half years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that was great. Yeah. Then what happened? Then I so, had... So why did you, yeah, why did you stop? First? I stopped because <coughs> they, the company, the umbrella company, yeah. um, that was doing some restructuring. They were changing a lot of things. And I also, I had to go to hospital right, okay. and recuperate for three months. I couldn't do any work. Right. And at that time, I thought, you know what? It's been great but I really should have been an entertainment producer. That's what I wanted to be. Right. I've taken this massive detour <laughs> and I want to try and change it. Well, no, actually, I'm lying. Not an entertainment producer. I keep saying that. That wasn't true. I wanted to be a producer and I thought off the back of working at this channel, which was mostly documentary, mm -hmm. that I wanted to do documentary. Right. So 
because I had this three months off, I was trying to work out, I asked for redundancy, mm -hmm. didn't know what I was going to do, thought I'd spend that three months trying to work out what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and then came up with the idea of going back to film school to do an right. MA. Right. So I got a place at Bournemouth, so I was going to do their MA in September 2009. Mm -hmm. And then found out I had to go into hospital at the, in the September. Right for something completely unrelated, and I was going to be off for another three months, which meant I couldn't start in that September. Right, okay. So that year was a bit of a crap year. But my friend kept saying to me, well, why don't you go to National Film Television School? Mm -hmm. And I was like, you must be joking. Have you seen the people that come out of there, like Kim Long Janetto, you know, Nick Broomfield, all these like big, mm. big um, documentary directors. And I just kept going back to the website and thinking I would love to go there, but I don't know how I'm going to afford it, and I'm, I don't know if I'm good enough for it. And then I just started looking at the other courses, and there was an entertainment, producing and directing entertainment course. And I kept looking at it thinking, actually, I love documentary, but I, th this course really spoke more to me in terms of my pe personality. What, yeah, what was that? What, yeah. It just was, I, it was just, I, lo I loved work, watching l entertainment, live events, Right, music, okay. all yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I just thought, I don't know how much of a career I personally can make doing documentary. Sure. And lots of documentary is a bit kind of, it's a lot of sad stuff. Sure. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is, do you yeah, know what I mean? It's always, yeah. there was, there's a reason why it's documentary. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And my personality, I would probably <laughs> in the most, you know, Unopportune moments, be cracking a joke. Do you know? I would. You know, someone might be dying in the corner, and I want to have something to say about it. Sure. No, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't think that's appropriate. Clearly, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You need to know what's <laughs> right. I, that, that's just, that's yeah. just me. So I have a quite a dark sense of humour. So I thought, in order to have some sort of a career, documentary <laughs> is probably not right for right. me. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say I did love other side of TV. I did sure. love it, live events and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I kept going back to this website and seeing this course and when I first look, looked at it they had a deadline coming up but I thought I wasn't ready for it, I wasn't prepared to do mm -hmm. it. But I would always like, every couple of days I would go back and look and I think it was just me dreaming of being mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And then one day I looked at it and they closed the deadline and I was like shit I should have applied, <laughs> yeah, I really missed out. But kept going back and then right, two okay. weeks later they opened it up again and I thought this is my chance, I can apply. And um, so then I went to the, the application process and at NFTS, the application process is a nine page application form, a treatment, a two page A4 treatment of your own idea, a two page critique of an existing TV show, right. and a two page critique of the idea you're sending in to, to apply for the film school. And I just looked at that and went, are you joking? I'm not, you must be joking, there is no way. I just, I thought, no. And so I just, so, and again, this is a cheeky thing. So I just looked at it and went, I, there's got to be a way around this. There has to be a way around this. Because like, you didn't want to do all that. I didn't and want then to do all this work or, and yeah. then someone goes, uh-uh. Do you know what I mean? No, you're not getting in. I'm just not prepared, I was not prepared for that. And also I was, I was still recuperating, so I just thought, no, I can't be bothered. So I ended up finding out the head of the department's personal email address online on the internet. Mm -hmm. I literally spent out, I'm like, I'm going to find his email address. <laughs> personal, I don't even know why I decided it was personal. He's, he's, his email address was on the NFTS website, but I was like, I'm finding his personal one. <laughs> so I did. And I sent in my CV and I um, basically sent him an email saying, look, I really think this course is brilliant. I would love to go try for it. You know, it sounds like the sort of thing I would love to do. Um, could you just look at my CV and let me know whether you think I should apply? Mm. And I thought, you know what, it's with the, the gods of TV and film. And I literally pressed it on a Tuesday night in my pajamas like that, pressed it, said, pray to everything I could. And I went to bed and then it was in bed still recuperating from this operation mm. and uh, it's like 10 o'clock in, in the morning and I get this phone call and I literally picked up my phone, didn't even look at it, went, oh, hi. This guy goes, is this, I can't do a northern accent, he's from the north. 
is this Abigail Dankman? And I went, yes. And you're thinking, who the fuck is this? Because no one says your... <laughs> No one says your full name. Do you know what I mean? You answer the phone, you go, okay, is, is that Abigail? Is that, you know, can I speak to Abigail? And they say, is this Abigail Dankwa? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, this is David G. Croft from the National Film and Television School. And I was like, fuck, I'm still in bed. Got out of bed, I'm walking around my bedroom. Like, yeah, I've been up at 6.30 in the morning. Going, yeah, 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 he's asking me all these questions. So I'm on the phone for like 20 minutes. And then he said at the end, you must apply. And I was like, okay, cool. Put that on the phone. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I kind of had to stop myself and go, all he's done is ask you to apply. He hasn't given you anything. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> so then I had to do, I, I then had to do the whole nine page this, two page that, two, I did the whole thing. Right. Then I had to do a showreel. Uh, so I did a showreel. I remember taking down my, my showreel to NFTS, giving it to them. And then I found out on my birthday that I was going in and oh, I got wow. all the place. And that's how that started. Yeah. And so I went there thinking I was going to be come out working towards becoming an entertainment producer because right. of course I was producing and directing television entertainment okay. and I was set in my head I'm going to be a producer <laughs> I'm going to come out I want to be a producer because I'm quite organized and a bit right. of a control freak so I thought yeah that's me and then the directing element of the, the actual course I thought well I'm not really interested I've got to do it it's part of the course but I don't really care and then sat in the director's chair and I was like oh, <laughs> this is nice <laughs> this is control. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> this is the real control. This is where it's at. And yeah, so then changed my mind in right, that okay. course. So it was a two year course and right. that was it. That's, okay. that's what set me off. And then what after that? So, oh. You got a job directing straight away to do Yeah, that. I did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was doing like strictly. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, well, my thing was, so I don't know if you know, NFTS is in Beaconsfield. So I live in London. I'm a proper Londoner. So I, and also I'm from a London, well, not so much now, but then proper London party girl. So someone goes, Abigail, do you want to come out? I'm like, I am there, so I'm there. So I then thought, you know what, you've got to do a two year full time course. You can't party anywhere, Abigail, you need to calm down. So I moved to Beaconsfield where sweet FA happens, nothing happens there. But it was brilliant, so I spent all my time there. I lived right. literally six minutes away from film school. Right. And I used to um, finish like stupid o'clock in the morning and go home and then wake up, get changed, get, and go back in right. again. It was brilliant, I loved it. And so I you worked, worked my, hard the whole I time worked, you're, at, you're at film school. I worked, okay. no, seriously. <laughs> well, I kind of worked hard. Because I was also student union president. Because, oh, okay. because we used to have, the, we had a student union bar. Do you have a bar here? Do we have? Oh, <laughs> you're missing out. They haven't got time, they haven't got time for drinking. <laughs> They're so busy working. Oh, you're all better the than time. I am, then. Good. Are they not? <laughs> it's nice to see them all in together. <laughs> really? I'm joking. They are very hard. Good. Working. Well done. Some of them. You. Well done. Um, yeah, no, I just, en I just enjoyed it. I just enjoyed right. the experience of being around creative people and finding my. I'm really. And it sounds a bit sort of. Uh, but finding your tribe, find the people yeah. you're going to hang around with and you want to do good work with, because I think you, you probably all know this already, but the people you're with now, find your people, because you are going to need your people when you get out the other side. Because when you get out the other side, this cosy little nice warm bubble you have here will not exist. I tell you this now, sure. it yeah, just will, it will yeah. not exist. Because freelancing work, the freelancing life is hard mm, sure. it's you have to get every bit of motivation just to send an email out some days there mm. are days when i just think oh can't be oh, i can't be asked so unless you're doing are we are there any fiction directors or drama directors in here okay you probably are slightly easier in terms of that if you get to a level you'll you'll have an agent who will go out and get your work the rest of you you're on your own <laughs> you are you lit because you are you yeah, have to sure. get your it's the job you will do as a freelancer. And the one thing I quickly realise is there are three parts to your job. One is getting the job. The next bit is a bit that you're, that's, that's what you're all here for, is doing that job. And the next bit is getting the money for doing that job. Because right, like so, yeah. sometimes getting the money for doing that job is harder than actually doing, doing the, the job. job. And yeah. you just have to, you, you kind of need to get that into your head because yeah, yeah. no one tells you that. No. And it can be, and it and also starting out. Sometimes it takes time, so yeah, that's kind of that's where I got to in terms of 
film school, I came out and I worked on, no, before I, I came out, I was working on uh, Champions League finals as a floor manager for UEFA. Right. So I was doing those and I started in Wembley doing the 2011 uh, Champions League final. Who was a floor manager? As a floor manager. So a floor manager is basically telling a presenter when to st where to stand, when to talk, when not to talk, moving cameras around. Um, and basically, you're the eyes and ears of the director. Because the director, um, for those kind of events, is a multi-camera director. And they're sitting in an OB van or a gallery somewhere else. So you are their, uh, their eyes and ears. Mm -hmm. So if, any, if he wants, or she, well, predominantly it's here, unfortunately, but if they <laughs> want something done, they are going to usually ask the floor manager to do it. So I'm quite good at talking, clearly. <laughs> and um, most of it rubbish, but I'm good at talking and getting people to do things that they might not necessarily want to do. Right. Um, yeah. Or getting people out of the way. A lot sure. of the times it's, it's shutting people up around you, moving people out of the way so you can do whatever you have to do. So there's a lot of negotiation kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you were enjoying that? I yeah. loved it. Yeah. I yeah. absolutely, yeah. I mean, going to, who's, has anyone been to Wembley Stadium, right, at, at a big event? And just the atmosphere is amazing. I love it. <laughs> right, like, yeah. Because you're, you're in this place and it's got 80,000 people. You know, they're not all cheering for the same thing when it's football, <laughs> but... They all want they want their team to win. Yeah, and it's, yeah. They're passionate, and it's this whole collective thing. And it's crazy. I love it. So I did that for them. I did Champions League final, Europa final. Uh, I think yeah, it was only those two that year. Then I graduated in 2012, and then one of my first jobs from graduating was as a stage manager on the opening and closing ceremonies of the Olympics and Paralympics. Right. So I literally came out did a small job, then went straight onto that. And I'd never been in a stage manager before. Right, and how was that? It was amazing, but hard work. Really, really hard work. I learned a lot really quickly because there was 25, uh, there were 25 assistant floor managers, sorry, assistant stage managers. And they were in their first year or their third year of, of drama school. So they were training right, to okay. be proper you know, stage managers, West End stage managers. Yep. And then there were 24 proper full-time stage managers. Mm -hmm. So big West End, uh, live events, corporate events, all that kind of stuff. They know their shit. And then there was me, who knew <laughs> nothing about anything. <laughs> and I got in there because I worked with this woman on um, UEFA Champions League final. And right. she was a stage manager then. But what I didn't realise what she was doing, or what her next big gig was, she was going to be the head stage manager for the Olympics. Wow. Okay. And I didn't know yeah. that at the time, right, okay. but I got on really well yeah. with her and she was yeah. like, we need new blood, do you want to come and work? And I was like, okay. So I did that, it was one of my first big jobs and it was brilliant. Crazy, but brilliant. Was it stressful at all? <sighs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was, a, it was What was the most stressful thing about it? <sighs> well, I had to kind of, confused. so I was, I don't know, I don't know. 2012, how old was I you? Like roughly, shout out to how old were you? 14. 14. Do you, do you, did, you, did any of you watch it? Did any of you see it? Um, so there was a bit called Thanks Tim, where they, there's these, this couple who danced through the generations, uh, sorry, danced through the decades of music. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, you know, UK and it's all dancing. So I was the rehearsal stage manager for that. So basically I had to make sure that everything was ready for Danny Boyle and Hamish Hamilton because we were going to rehearse that. I have never worked at that level before. So basically, I would, like, Danny would want to do something and I'll go, you can't do that. So you can imagine if... <laughs> you like the control there. I love the control. <laughs> but do you imagine when, the, when, they, yeah. when they were in the meeting and they say, OK, Abigail, you're the stage manager, you're rehearsal stage manager for that. OK, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. If they need this, you can like, give them parameters, but, you know, there's certain things they can do, they can't do. And you've got to tell Danny Boyle that he can't do something. <laughs> really? <laughs> But I had no choice. That was my job. How did he take it? Well, he, 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 he gives you the kind of the look and you go, but no. And you just have to do sure. it. Yeah. Or you find ways around things. But you know, or, but there were times, <laughs> okay, so there was, a, there was, I had to do, there was another bit that I had to do. And it was for, I think it was for opening ceremony. 
And there's a bit where the sco these school kids are singing, I think it's when they're singing in Jerusalem. And, but the stadium hadn't been finished yet. And they had to, we had to go up into the, like, the gods of the stadium because that's where they were going to sing next to this, the tour where the big tree was. But the stadium was not finished and there was crap everywhere. <laughs> and, but you just had to rehearse. You know, we had to get this done. These kids, there was like 200 kids or whatever. I, and my, it, I was in charge of that rehearsal. I had to get with my other team, these 200 kids from like, the car park or wherever it was, they were dropped off through the whole stadium which was unfinished, a health and safety nightmare, into the bowels of the stadium. And so I decided I would go do a recce just to see how bad it was. And it was awful. It was <laughs> trying so hard not to swear, can you tell? It was awful. Right. So, and I get there, I'm like, you can't, these kids are like, they're primary school children. You can't bring them here. But we have to, right? So I get out of there. And I'm still, this is quite early on, I think, and I'm still new to all the, the tech and the gubbins and all the right. comms and all this sort of stuff. So I've got my clipboard, I've got my running orders and all my pens and I've got you know, high vis and belts and shit everywhere. And so I'm up there and I'm literally going crazy. I'm like, we can't bring kids up here. And I'm literally like, what the fuck does that one thing they're doing? We can't bring kids and fucking mess up here. Blah, 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 fuck it. <laughs> and people are coming up and, and uh, I'm talking sort of, and we're all, everyone's like, this is crazy. This is, I can't fucking do it. can't fucking do it. And then someone comes up and they're like this. <laughs> and I'm like, but it's fucking crazy. We can't fucking do this. And they're like, I'm going to go, like and I'm like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and I didn't realise, because I used to have my comm thing here, right. and I was holding my file here, it was hitting the button, and it was basically going to anyone who had comms on that day, <laughs> was hearing me go, this is fucking crazy. <laughs> and also, in the gallery where Hamish Hamilton was, he was the TV director of the live event, and Danny Brewer was in the gallery, <laughs> where he this weird six foot black woman going, this is fucking crazy, you can't do that. <laughs> like this. That's brilliant. Yeah, so it's a great story, but wasn't my proudest moment. But the, the, the thing with that one, though, was <laughs> someone that then came up and they were like, at least I saw you cared. You cared right, enough. Right. It really wasn't the best way of showing it, <laughs> but I, I cared enough to go, you know, sure. we need to do things properly. Yeah. And that's another thing is, you know, as long as you're trying to do the best for sure. your situation, sure. people will take that on board. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah. So there was another time when uh, I think it was closing ceremony Paralympics, and they had um, cars and well different vehicles coming up from the different vom. So a vom is an entrance into the stage into the stadium, um, and a vom which I like, I didn't know before it was short for vomitory. So in the Greek ages, um, when they always used to stuff their faces go and watch some sort of chariot race, um, they would then go around the corner and be sick. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's where vomitory comes from. Ah. And then go back and eat more food, watch more racing, and then go back and be sick. So yeah, okay. that's my lovely little bit of <laughs> knowledge Education. that I got. Education. Education. No, yeah. every, you know, every day's a school day. So, uh, <laughs> so what we, there was a, so we were doing this thing. So let's, this is the, they call it the field of play. So that's where, like the football pitches, whatever. So that's the shape of the stadium floor, the field of play. And then there's these entrances all the way around, the VOMs. And then when you, they, they have a ring road around the outside, which is what you don't see as the audience. But that's where we would place all the vehicles right. to get ready to be queued on to the field of play. And off the back of that, there are then these long roads that lead off, lead off it. And so we had cars, round, cars, lorries, motorcycles, bicycles, all around the field of play, um, in the ring roads around the outside, and up these roads. And my job, one of my jobs was with another uh, stage manager, was to queue on one of the roads, so to queue the, the vehicles onto the right. field yeah. of play. So, you, we, and we had cars from all different areas, and boat, motorcycles and everything like that. So, you're, in your ears, you would have a show caller, and a show caller is calling out the next scene and how long is, it is to the next scene to your cued on. And the other ear is a choreographer who is dealing with all the dancers who are on the field of play or whatever. So you have to listen to two things at the same time. So you've got two in ears going and a he headset on top of that. 
And so we, we're waiting to queue on. And so my job would be to go basically up and down the line, just check all the volunteers who were in the cars, vehicles, whatever, were OK. So I'm going down, and we're very close to starting. I'm going down, and then someone says, oh, yeah, they're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm running over, running over. Yeah, OK, OK. Yeah, the car won't start. And this is a car <laughs> that is very close to the very front right. of the ring road before going on in front of 80,000 people in a stadium and a billion people wherever they were in the world <laughs> waiting for this ceremony to happen and the car won't start. Right. <laughs> and I'm literally having to, we had, luckily we had the AA, we literally had the AA there. <laughs> so I had to it's call the AA, AA <laughs> and get the guy to fix the car because if the car didn't move, That's amazing. that ceremony was over. That was, and that was like, you can't do that again. It's live. You know, it ha the car has to work. You have to make the car work. I'm <laughs> literally going, and they're counting. So this, and everyone else is oblivious. Sure, yeah. Because now I know how to use my comms. So everyone else is oblivious apart from me and the people you know around in that particular area. And we're just literally just praying to the gods of Olympia and everybody else, going, "You've got to make this work." And it did, and it, right, it worked. Okay. And so there's lots of that thing that happens at a live event that you. There's, there, were th there are things that happened or didn't happen at the Olympics open and closing ceremonies and Paralympics open and closing ceremonies that no one knows about because you all think it went off like a dream. And I'm here to tell you, it didn't always. <laughs> I can't tell you one of them, but there were some things that never, that should have happened, that didn't happen. Right, and literally, yeah. like the show caller will go, that's not happening, and move along. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone goes, okay. And we all just tear that sheet of paper, dash it, and move on to the next thing. But yeah, that's that's live events. Well, I love it. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. A, a live events go. It's pretty insane. Oh, it's yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah. It's yeah. lovely. I love it. It's a, an adrenaline rush. You don't get that. I don't think anywhere else in television you sure. or film. You you just don't get no, that. No, sure. So for me, when I was um, I was uh, stage, I was on the on the Paralympics closing ceremony. I was on the field of play because I had to help some of. Um, the volunteers go up these things called the sway poles mm -hmm. and so they had different disabilities so some needed more help than others mm -hmm. and because they were quite high up in there they needed someone you had to be there basically for health and safety so you're on the, self help, uh, you're on the field of play and I there was parts of it you would see like lo people's cameras taking flashes and it was just amazing and I one, at one point, I literally, I want to hear, I wanted to feel and hear what the crowd is sound like. So I took my headphone off and just the roar of 80,000 people just screaming all for the same time, I think is exhilarating. It's amazing. It's madness. I love it. <clears throat> so, yeah, and uh, did you manage to stay in doing that kind of thing? or what? what no, because <laughs> I, I knew I didn't, because I was very conscious of, going down one road and ending up being there right, for too okay. long, like going to be an, an intern doing acquisitions and ending up running a cha channel, that was never a plan. And I could see myself falling into that world because those kind of stage managers, they bounce from all the different live events. Sure. So from that, they went on to Russia, to, they went to Sochi to do the Winter right, Olympics. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, I'd love to do it, but I, I'm, I've made my decision to be a director. I need to get back to that. Yeah. So this was a nice thing to do, and it looked great on my CV, and everyone was like, oh my God, how'd you do it? But it was never meant to happen. Right. Um, so then I ended up doing just little bits and pieces of floor managing. I did a bit of um, ADing on some shorts for Sky. I did, a three, I did about f three or four Sky shorts. Um, how did you find that? It was it great. Very different. very different. And it, again, I hadn't, I hadn't trained for that, so I might have gone to film school, but I did t TV, so mm -hmm. at NFTS. You know, doing television is like the worst thing that can happen to you. Do you know what I mean? For some, because they, I used to call it like the bastard child of the film school, because you have like cinematographers going, oh, well, we do cinematography, and oh, I'm a director, and oh, I'm a writer. And it's like, I remember the, they have this thing called Crossbeck, which they used to have when you first started, and everyone used to try out different disciplines, so you can mm -hmm. learn about different disciplines and meet other people. And then at the, end, at the end, you have the prospect party. I remember being at the bar and this guy goes, I said, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm doing TV. And he goes, oh, you're doing drama. Are you doing, uh, no, you're doing fiction. And I said, no. And he goes, are you a writer? And I said, no. And I goes, oh, what are you doing? You, you said you're doing uh, TV, but are you do, doing documentary? I was like, no. I said, oh, he goes, what are you doing here? 
And I'm like, well, I'm here doing the masters, producing and directing television and entertainment, right? Because it's, you know. Yeah. And he goes, that's not, this is a film school. <laughs> I was like, I'm literally in my head going, you. <laughs> and it, he, I said, well, you know, it doesn't say the national <laughs> film television school <laughs> out the front, because they had this big thing, big say thing. I said, it's a national film television school. I'm here to do television, TV. Yeah. And, but that's, at the that's time, snobbery, it's probably yeah. changed now, but that snobbery between that's film and TV. Well, I'm probably, yeah, I'm probably right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was just like, this is what I wanted to do, it was television. So I then, but I wanted to get into more entertainment stuff. That's yeah. really what I wanted to okay. do. But getting, and I thought I wanted to, what I looked at was um, other directors when I was at film school, what they had done, right. kind of the entertainment directors. And a lot of them had come through floor managing. Mm -hmm. So I decided, you can come in from different ways. Mm -hmm. Floor managing, you can be a VT operator, or like what they called it at the time, um, a PA, and that's the script supervisor who counts down for the shots, especially in music, or you could be a vision mixer. And they were all great <laughs> roles, but I just thought, because I'd done the floor managing before, um, and because, uh, sorry, because I was a stage manager before and it's very close in terms of the skills. Sure. So being a floor manager, that's what I want, wanted to do mm -hmm. after doing the Olympics. <laughs> Little did I know, there's a cabal of about 10 floor managers in the UK who literally do everything, right. all the good stuff. Okay, yeah. So it's really hard to get in. Right. So even trying to get in to, to shadow them is really, a nightmare. Right, okay. Just to be a runner is a nightmare. And I tried really, really hard. What kind of things did you do to try? Just <coughs> literally emailing people, looking at this, the, the credits and going to LinkedIn, trying to find them on LinkedIn, Google, because I, I know how to get people's email addresses. <laughs> yeah, and their personal, <laughs> and email their email personal ones. <laughs> um, yeah, just emailing people, Stalking, trying to- basically. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not call it that, because that's <laughs> slightly illegal. But yes, um, yeah, just trying as much as, you know, trying to build relationships. Mm. And a few people were nice and they'll get you in, but you just knew that they had like 20 other people in front of you who had been runners since Dot, right. who, would, who would probably get that before you. Mm -hmm. And so I just, and I did weird things like, I don't know if they still do it now, but ITV used to do, used to have this, um, group on LinkedIn and you could go and you could go and do two weeks work experience or a couple of days work experience on different shows. So I would apply for that. Just thought I want any way I can to get a look in. Yeah, yeah. Just even just to look and see what a proper studio was like, how they ran it. Mm -hmm. And I so I ended up one day doing being um, a stand I was like a I was a, a stand in, a judge's stand in for a Davina McCall dance show. Like a real random thing. <laughs> Like my job was literally to sit in a judge's seat and pretend to be a judge so they could get the right shot, um, <laughs> right. the framing right. That's all I did for like three days. Do you know what I mean? And I, and then I would then like, they would call me up and I'd have to be a contestant. Right. You know, and so they could get the shots all right. Right, right. I just thought as long as I'm getting near, I'm getting close, cool. I can make connections and meet people and get numbers and get emails so I can and go back to that? them. Is that something you... Yeah, 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 I think, but I worked at it. I had to sure. work at it. I wasn't yeah. initially that good at right. networking, but I learned how to do that. Okay. Um, and I remember there was a time when I was on, I was a contestant and one of the, this floor manager who does, one of the guys who does everything, and he was like, so how did you come here? And, oh, first rule, oh first God. rule, cardinal sin. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so this, state, this floor manager was like, so how did you get here? And he was asking me about you know, what I did before. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was at film school. And what did you do after film school? And I was like, I was, this, on the, I was a stage manager on the Olympics. And he was like, how did you get that? And I was like, oh, because I met someone doing the Champions League final and, and uh, I used to get her comms and make her tea and do her production notes and all this sort of stuff, which I didn't have to do at the time. Right. But I just did it because I was the intern working on this thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was like, after it finished, she said, oh, well, let's stay in touch. I've got this little job that might happen. And off the back of that, I ended up working on the, the Olympics. And he was like, oh my God, how did you do that? Because all, all the floor managers wanted to be on the, st on the stage <laughs> managers of the Olympics and none of them got on. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. Because you would, yeah, it was just, Brilliant. it was, because all of them ended up being 
um, they were doing the actual sports floor manager. There was the floor managers for the sports events. Right. But right. all they wanted to do was work on the opening closing ceremonies. Right. Yeah. But none of them got on. Right. Because they hadn't had experience. And I was and he was like, But you didn't have experience. I was like, I know, but I knew the right people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that was yeah. it. It was just being nice, making tea, which is a bit rubbish, but that's how but you yeah, get but in it's sometimes. You put the effort in with anybody and everybody who came across. Yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because you never know. You don't you know no. you <clears> never know. You don't know who you're talking to. No. So be nice yeah. to everyone, yeah. even if it pains you. <laughs> and there are times that it will pain you, but you have to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so where are we now? So you've done a few bits and bobs. Um, so yeah, I did. So I did some uh, aiding for the Sky Shorts, and then. Uh, and what was it about that? Because we were just talking about that. What was it that was different about that that you liked or didn't like, or knew you didn't want to do? It, it was for me. It was just I wanted. To, I wanted to just. Oh, this is a very annoying fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just one fly in the building. It oh, is it? Just seems to be attacking oh, us. Right, okay. I don't know why. Um, <coughs> and what did I like? I. Just want to, because I, I had done drama or mm -hmm. short films or fiction at film school, but I wanted it, well, one, it was paying. Sure. If I'm being completely <laughs> honest, it was paying. And I wasn't working, <laughs> it was paying. And so I just thought, I'd always thought in the future, I might like to do a short film just for my own sake to see if I could do it. Sure. But that was like way in the future. Yeah. But I thought, you know what? It would be nice to see how other productions work, you know, yeah. a different genre works. And so I ended up just ADing on this uh, short. The, the original one was the short for, um, it was a not for TV pilot for Channel 4. And it was just great fun. And they just, they, they just let me go on with it, even though I didn't know what I was doing, because it was slightly different from right. floor managing. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. dealing with actors in that way. And I was just, I'd never dealt with actors before. Right. And dealing with directors and, you know, yeah, I just, it was just different. Dealing with scripts in that way, a different right, sure. way of working and, you know, and continuity, which I'd never had to deal with continuity mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. It was a different way of working, but I really enjoyed it. Um, so I did a few of those. I did my last one last year and it was, we did it in one of the hottest weekend, hottest weeks of last year. And it was, and we were doing it in a restaurant and they had to black out the restaurant because it was night time. So we were all sweltering. At that point, I was like, I do not want to do this anymore. <laughs> I love it, but I like the confines of a gallery and a studio. You've got air con and people bring you food. <laughs> I like that world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I did that. And then um, at one point, I was talking to a mentor. And I've got lots of different kind of mentors, but yeah. a particular mentor who had been, at, she was a tutor at film school. But I didn't really talk to her much. I met her um, after that. And I said to her, look, I want to be a multi-camera director. I know it's going to take me at least 10 years. What do I have to do to get myself on that road, to position myself to be in the right place? Because I'm a firm believer of trying to, n trying to work out what you need before you need it, if that makes sense, or meet people before you need sure. them. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So that if, you get a, if a job comes up and you know those people before that, before you know that job is available, mm -hmm. they see your name and they go, hi, Abigail. They know you, right. do you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's, so I was saying to her, look, what do I have to do? And she said, I don't know. And I was like, great. <laughs> and then she, she said, to her credit, she said, oh, you know, we'll work it out. So she, she went to an event where a guy quite high up in Endemol was, and she asked him, you know, I've got this woman who wants to be a director, not a camera director, what should she do? And he said, get her to send her CV to me. So I did, and then he said to me, send your CV here, there and everywhere. And I don't know if you know Endemol, Endemol's got lots of different, different production companies under its wings. So mm -hmm. I was sending it all over Endemol, right. not getting a response from anybody. <laughs> and you'll learn that if you work in te television, people are quite slow or lazy, pick your word, or getting busy. back to you, <laughs> or busy. But yeah, they're, they're quite slow in getting sure. back to you yeah, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, because they don't, if they don't recognise your name, it's like you're cool. one of a thousand people who sent me an email on that day. Do yeah. you know? And they've got work to do. So yeah, yeah. I do appreciate yeah. it. I'm being a bit flippant, but yeah. Um, so I sent it and then one day I got an email back from the series director of Big Brother. And it, Big Brother was a show that I liked when it first came out, which is probably showing my age. Um, but I wasn't really kind of, 
you know, this alliteration from moving from Channel 4 to Channel 5 had changed. It was a very different show. Sure. And I was a bit like, oh, it's not really me. And also, I didn't know how they directed that show because it wasn't sure. a true mod to camera directed show. But this guy wanted to see me, so I thought, oh, I'll just go and see him. It's another collection. Um, and then when I got there, he said, oh, um, cause also what I didn't realise at the time was Love Island was starting up. And so directors from Hothead, direct, sorry, gallery directors from Big Brother were jumping ship to go over to do Love Island. So he had a gap that he wanted to fill. So when I turned up to meet him, he said, oh, I'm, you know, this is the reason why I'm wanting to talk to people. I've got 80 CVs that I've been through. I'm meeting 20 people of which you are one. And I need five directors who I want as brand new directors. I want to train them up to be directors for Big Brother. And when he said that, I was like, I haven't got a chance because I've never directed anything. I've done assistant directing, floor managing, stage managing, but I hadn't at this point like done, done anything. Right. So I was a bit like, you know, you kind of go, yeah, well, I'm, I've, I've not got this job, so I could just relax <laughs> in this meeting. So I was just chatting, having a laugh, say goodbye to him. And then a week later, he emails to say, yeah, I want you to be one of the directors. And I was like, so <laughs> and how much do you think that was because you were relaxed because you I think a lot yeah. of it was because because I in my head I was just like no one's going to give me the opportunity it's big brother no matter what kind of what, what your thoughts are of it it's sure. a big brand yeah, yeah. No, definitely. and when you when, when a production company has a big brand they're quite loath to get new people in because they might muck it up it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I just thought um they're not, I'm not going to get I haven't got a chance I've never directed anything. And he was talking about, you know, the kind of directing and he was asking me whether I thought I could do it. And I was like, yeah, I think I could do it. Do you know what I mean? He's trying, trying to muster up this energy to think I could do it. And I was just like, yeah, okay. And then, uh, yeah, so I didn't think I got it. But right. I, think, I think you could see that I put a lot of effort into trying to A, get into the job that I wanted to do. Sure. And also the fact that I did lots of work experience. I talked yeah. to everybody. I tried to make connections. Yeah. I was really trying really hard sure. to get into the industry. Sure. So I think he could see that. Yeah. And I think he thought, I'll give her a go. And I'm sure if I was rubbish, he'd get rid of me anyway. So sure. it wasn't that bad a deal for him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. He didn't yeah, have to take me on. Yeah. So I got the gig. And then a couple of weeks later, I was at Elstree. And they have the thing called, they call it guinea pigs. Or well, guineas. So guineas is basically where before the show goes live, they will get the, the next 10 to 15 people who didn't make the cut to be in Big Brother, so the contestants, to come in to stress test the house. Right. Okay. Basically to check that all the mirrors are in the right place. Because where all the mirrors are in Big Brother, that's where there's a camera behind. There's a, a manned camera behind. Mm -hmm. So there's five manned cameras and there's a, 80 odd fixed rig cameras so you mm -hmm. direct those cameras mm -hmm. so you learn how the house feels to direct it right. because every year they change the set so it right. always looks different yeah. so your job for the for two weeks is to basically do a mini big brother and in play it like a mini big brother and direct it so you learn how to do it you have to learn where the cabling goes you have to learn which way around and you direct as a pair so it's a very different kind of directing and how's There's that work directing as a pair what's that so for instance um so you in, say for instance this is the gallery in front of me, there is so there's two um, two main streams, mm -hmm. A and B. So we would sit next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, they would be the, so you vision mix direct as well. So I'm right, vision okay. mixing at the okay. same time. So there's no separate vision. No separate vision, okay. vision mixer. So there's me. Then there's a hot head operator next to me. There's the hot sound. Head hot head operator. Hot head operator. For the for all the hothead cameras that are in. So, you know when you go to like shops and you see the CCTV cameras that are stuck? So it's literally those type of cameras, better mm -hmm. versions, but those type of cameras. So if there was in this room, there'd be one there, I could get to focus Chris from you, one there from me, there'll be another one there, there'll be someone going that way to you. So I could get all different angles. Yep. So I would direct the hothead operator on what I wanted to have okay. as a shot, yep. and I would cut it up. Right. So there'll be, um, three streams, so I would do, if it was, a, if it was a us, it would be two yeah. singles and a wide, yeah. I'd cut that up and you know, if they went off I'd have to remember if someone was going from the bathroom to the kitchen, which is quite a distance in Big Brother, you would have to remember all the different camera numbers to be able to do that sequence, wow. to get them yeah. to go, okay. so you follow them basically yeah, yeah. with all the cameras, yeah. so you had to know a, where all those cameras were, so you had to mentally know where they were, what numbers was associated with that camera, 
what where what window was there because you could also get a manned camera in to get better shots um, you had to be spatially aware you had to know the limitations of the cameras so you could know which camera would get a shot of a clean shot of somebody who was in a very awkward position. So like, how long will it take you to, you know, get all that knowledge? Oh, and flip it out. <laughs> um, it's, it's stressing me out thinking about it. It was it was stressful. <laughs> it was really stressful. I hated it. The first two weeks, I, I hated it because really? you you on that show, you um, direct for two hours. So it's two hours on, an hour off. Two hours on, an hour off. Two hours on, and you're off. right. Um, and then in your hour break, you and you have to do it that way because you get it's adrenaline rush. You get right. so stressed, and you're because right. they do crazy stuff. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Someone has a fight in the loo. They have to go to the kitchen to tell somebody and have a big argument. They have to go to the sky room to have a fag. <laughs> then they have to go to the bathroom to have a go at the person they first had a go at. And you're following them, and you've got to know 24, all the cameras to get them there right. and get them back. And also, there's another director doing exactly the same thing next to you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So. If I was in the kitchen with something that was happening in the kitchen, you would probably be doing another story oh, in the okay, bathroom. Okay, right, okay, got you. Because yeah. you, one, uh, you know, your story might die, so yeah. obviously there's nothing you can do. So right. they want to they want to catapultize. And who's deciding the stories, you or so the So behind producers? us, right, okay. there is a story producer. So okay. there's a bank of story producers. Right. And every now and then they go, can you give us a wide shot? And it's like, no, you can't get a wide shot from where they're sitting. But they can never, it's really weird <laughs> because they see exactly what you can see, but they would never know that the camera they wanted could get the shot they wanted. They were right. like, can you give us a wide shot? And you, <laughs> directors will look at each other, go, oh, fuck, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't get that shot. The camera can't get there. Do you know what I mean? The camera can't see around corners. Do you know? What I mean? Do you know? What I mean? It was just. Oh, but I loved it. But it was. Sure. But it was sure. mental. Right. So the first two weeks, I used uh, at least. Yeah, the first two weeks definitely that was training. That was guineas. But at least the first two weeks into the actual going live, I used to do my two hours on do my, start my hour off. In your hour, you would have to come in and do a tape change because they, for their legal reasons, you had to record everything. Right. So I'd come in, do a tape change. I would then walk out of the gallery, walk through the compound, walk down by the Tesco's, walk around the back of Tesco's, walk round to the wild um, part that they had three times to de-stress. Really? And literally go, just calm down, there we go. it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> literally for, that was a month of my life. Really? Or I would do, I mean, I'll just do one hour. If you don't like it, you can go home. Just do one hour. If you don't like it, you can go home. Because I was so shit scared of it. It was right. so, because it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. And you've got like people, it. and also you have the story producers behind you who are basically looking for story. And so they can key into the, the mics of anybody else. So if you're in the kitchen with someone, the other director's in the bathroom with somebody else, and then someone smoking in the sky room, they could key into the sky room and hear that conversation. And if they thought that conversation was better than what you were on, you had to drop what you were on and go over to the sky room. Right, right. And it's just like bang, 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 getting all the cameras right and getting, right. you know, shouting to the hot head of right. Give me 32, give me 22, give me all that sort of stuff to get there before that conversation died a death. Right. And then you have to go somewhere else. So you have the story producers listening in at the time. And then in the cabins, there'll be the exec producers who are also watching on their monitors. Right. And they'll be, they might look at something and go, oh, that story looks rubbish. And then cue into the story producers going, what's that story? That looks rubbish. And then the story producers will then cue into us going, that story looks rubbish, change it. Do you know what I mean? Right, yeah, so yeah. you've got this constant noise going on right. all the time. So it's mental, but I loved it. <laughs> But it was, yeah. And it taught me a lot about directing hothead cameras right, and yeah. directing fixed rig, because that's very different from directing multi-camera directing. It's very, very different. Right. Yeah. Well, I loved it. And I, I'm very weird in that I do both, because you tend to get directors who are either fixed rig directors, and a lot of fixed rig directors come from single camera documentary. That's where they originally came from. Okay. So examples of fixed rig? So, yeah. Zombs of Fixed Rig, 24 Hours in A&E, which is another show that I did, or I do, I'm going to go back and do it this year for the fourth time. Um, GPs Behind Closed Doors, Love Island, uh, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. So, it's all those kind of shows, those kind of entertainment, reality, but they're... They so, what's are, the definition in that sense then of Fixed, the fixed Rig? Yeah. Yeah. It's to do with the technology. Right, okay. It's the rig. Right, so, okay. all, although you might have Made in Chelsea, that is a reality show. Sure. They also call Big Brother a reality show, yeah. but they're kind of different ends of the spectrum because right. re uh, 
Made in Chelsea, Towie, they are scripted reality. Sure. And they are with a single camera, you know, a director with a single camera going sure. out. Yeah. Whereas this is, it's an environment right. which has fixed rig cameras somewhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so it's about, that's about the rig. Got you. But yeah. th oh, even like SAS, you know, SAS, um, oh God, I can't remember the whole title of it. Do you know the SAS one? The, yeah, that's the one, which I would love to do. Bonus points. Yeah. Bonus points. <laughs> So that is, again, right. that is... And why would you they do, love to do that? Because it's completely different. I mean, I, I, do, I now do 24 hours in a &E and I love 24 right. hours in a &E. And I think that goes back to the whole thing when I was at the small digital TV channel. It's documentary and I like people. Right, cool. And although I love doing entertainment, I love them. They come in, they tell their story. We don't tell them what to say. Do you know, we can't make them do anything. Right. There so are no games the, involved. You yeah. follow them. Yeah. You're kind of reactive. And so is that similar? Is it a similar structure? Do they have story producers behind you? And yeah, They so how, don't how, have... How does that work? So <laughs> in the gallery, that's slightly different. So they have... So in the gallery, there'll be me, the director. I'll have a hot head operator. There'll be a sand... So actually, before I start, there are two galleries mm -hmm. with 24 hours in a &E. So one's for majors and one's for minors. So depending on the s severity of your accident, will depend which gallery would cover you. Mm -hmm. So if you can walk into A&E, you'll be covered by the majors gallery. Mm -hmm. And that means, and, and the, sorry, the minors gallery. Mm -hmm. And the minors gallery tends to be the more lighthearted stuff that you'll see in 24 hours in A&E. Mm -hmm. It's all the little jokey people, you know, right. come and hop along Cassidy with his little you know, broken leg on crutches and all that sort of right. stuff. All the fun stuff, the lighter stuff. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell them, can you guess which gallery I'm usually in? <laughs> and then <laughs> on majors, is this serious? Right, like okay. someone's fallen off a 30 foot build, a 30 foot ladder or something, sure, or yeah. they've been impaled by a railing, or yeah. do you know, it's a real- Things really, we shouldn't be laughing at. Things basically. we shouldn't be yeah. laughing yeah. at. Yeah. yeah. Try, I'll try not to. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but you, again, it, it, so I actually, last year was my first, I did do majors last year. So I right. did overnights in majors. Right, okay. And. It was great, the kind of, it was, it's a very different, it's a very different gallery. It's more, it is more serious. You do still have that dark humour because you see some stuff, some, you see stuff that you just wouldn't normally see. Like sure. I had a guy who had multiple stab boots. Right. So, and you see people who are, especially the elderly, who are coming towards the end of their life. So it's a sure. very different yeah. gallery. Um, and it, it was great. And, you, all your de and also with that, you're dealing with red phones a lot. So whenever you see the sequence of the red phones, it's red, the f you know, someone picks up the phone. Right. They, there's, a, a, there's an order of shots that you have to always take whenever the red phone. So whatever you're right. doing you in stop. majors, you have yeah. to stop or you have to kind of direct. You end up learning how to direct at the same, two stories at the same time. Right. But you have to take that because they need that. That's the start of the story. Right. So you'll have the shot, which is someone picking up the red phone going, hello, St. George's. And then there's another shot where they take out the form, they put the form, and then there's another shot where they put the form and they start taking down right, the details. Okay. So that sequence you have to capture. Right. So last year, I think it was on my, I did four overnights. I think it was on my second overnight. I had 10 red phones, like back to back. Wow. And what you kind of, I didn't appreciate until like probably the third one. Um, when the red phone comes, that means there's going to be an ambulance coming. Right. So you have to also take the ambulance arrival. So again, you kind of have to slightly drop what you're doing if you're following another story mm -hmm. and take the ambulance arrival. When you say slightly drop a story, well, how, you're how, kind how of can you do the other story whilst you're doing this story? So you, you, well, you because it's fixed rig, that's the kind of beauty with fixed rig in right. that regard is once you set up your cameras, so if they're in a bay and it's the patient on the bed, and two people to the right, friends okay. and family. Once you've got your wide shot, your three sing your and your singles, mm -hmm. you can kind of leave that for right, a bit okay, because they're not no one's going anywhere. <laughs> sure. Do you know what I mean? Just falling off a thirty foot ladder. Exactly. Yeah. And um, then you can take over doing the, the incoming ambulance. Right. Okay. But then I had, I think I had three red. I had three ambulance arrivals at the same time. And so they were backing up, because that's what, yeah, they have to wait right, okay. before they can get people in, because they have to find a bay, they have to write the right, director, uh, right doctors in, right. right staff in. So you then realize that, you know, every time a red phone comes, that means a, an ambulance has to come right. as well. Okay. So in that you have, 
hot head operator, me, a producer, an assi assistant producer, logger, who's also looking at other stories as well. So right. they're your other eyes and, and ears. Okay, and, to, and it's, is it your responsibility to find and follow the stories, or is the producer doing that? Or, yeah. Between the both, I'm a, very kind of, yeah. I'm a very editorial director, so right, I okay. like to get involved in the story. Sure. There yeah. are other directors who literally want to sit back and press buttons and wait for someone to tell them what to do. Right, I can't okay. do that because no, no, I'll get sure. really bored. Yeah. So I like to get involved. So when I'm in minors, if it's a slow day, so you have floor assistants on minors, mm -hmm. um, so they are literally going up to people and going, hi, I'm waiting for the garden and we're doing a show called 24 Hours in A&E, would you like to get involved? And right, okay. it's their job to actually go and speak to people right, to okay. get consent. And sometimes, depending on who you have as a runner, some, you have good runners and you have lazy runners. And I don't like lazy runners because sure. I think you should be out. We're here to get stories. So yeah. I will go, can you go to that couple? I would go over comments, can you go to that couple? They look really interesting. Can you go and speak to them and find out? Right. And so they will have to go and find out and then come back and let me know whether or not I can shoot them. Okay. While we're talking about runners and stuff, because, you know, yes. obviously for There's a lot of these teeth. guys, they'll be going and doing running, doing that kind yeah. of job. What, what qualities are you looking for? What, you know, what, what, do you, what are your pet hates and what your pet loves? Um, I love people who are... Good fun to be around, mm -hmm. but are hardworking mm -hmm. and know when you can be good fun and know <laughs> when you can be hard work and when you have to be hard working. Right, sure. um, and who kind of pick up things pretty quickly because things move quite fast. And unfortunately, especially now with budgets being cut on a lot of shows, there isn't enough time to sit there and literally handhold you through everything. Mm -hmm. So you have to be quite quick on the uptake and get things very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, be friendly, uh, just, and try, try, and this is a difficult balance, try to anticipate without trying to feel like you know more than the other people, because there <laughs> are runners who come in going, oh, I don't know if I would do it like that. <laughs> it's not your job to tell me whether or not you can do it like that. When you can sit in the seat, you can do whatever you like. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Sure. No, no, There's well, a difference yeah. between yeah. telling me or going, oh, Abigail, I've spotted something. Have you seen this? Do you know what I mean? Sure, no, absolutely. Rather than going, oh, what about that? You know, I don't think I should do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, which I've had. <laughs> sure, yeah. And now you just go, really? <laughs> I don't know if you're going to be here this time next year. Do you know what I mean? It's like, because when it, when, so for instance, I'm in a gallery, I mean, especially in majors, because um, actually in majors, they have two uh, researcher loggers. There were times when, for, I remember there was time when we were, I think it was a night where we had all the, the red phones and the ambulances coming in. I can only see so much, and I have got very wide peripheral vision. I can only see so much. So sometimes I might go, okay, I know, because I've seen, I've taken in the red phone, I'm, and they've given you the ETA. I know if the red phone's going to come, I, I know the ambulance is going to come in the next seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Can you just look at those, because the, they're all the cameras are in locations. So I'm just doing it from memory. All the uh, cameras for the exterior of the hospital are, are in my top right hand corner. Right. So I will say to um, one of the assistants to just look. When you see a blue light coming through, because it's dark, obviously, it's so overnight. Yeah. If you see a blue light, let me know, because then I know that I can get a camera ready for yeah. bringing that sh shot in. Sure. Yeah. So I, they have to be my eyes and ears. Mm. I need them to tell me that but in such a way that doesn't distract me too much from what I'm doing. So I need them to go, Abigail, ambulance is coming. No, Abigail, ambulance is coming. <laughs> Do you know, like a major sure. incident. I just need them to go, Abigail, ambulance is coming. Do you want to cover it? And sure. we just, yeah. it's a collaborative so thing. It's that nuance. Yeah, it's, it's diff yeah. yeah. and it's yeah. just, though sometimes that's all the difference yeah. it takes. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, yeah, helpful. Um, I'm going to open it to the floor a little bit. Any questions thus far? Anyone got any questions? Yes. Um, with 24 hours now, yeah. How does consent work? Because uh, like obviously you're filming people with injuries. Yes. It's obviously straight away. It's not like you film it and then they're like, no, we don't want this footage, or do you just, like, how does it work? So, okay, so I'll, there's two sets of, of, because you have majors and minors, there's different kinds of, of, of consent. So in minors, what will happen is a floor assistant will go up and say to any, everybody, do you want to be in the show? And they can have three, there are three kind of choices. There's like what we want, full consent. So we can follow them with mics and everything. Then there is kind of background consent, which means that, for instance, you two have given me full consent, but you, I can see you in the shot, right? <laughs> um, but you don't want to be involved if, for instance, one of them turns around to talk to you. They don't, you don't want, so that's background <laughs> consent. So you are literally there for background. You're just... <laughs> 
the filler in a way. Do you know what I mean? But that's you're doing the a very way. Good job, Louise. You're doing a yeah, it's amazing, really good. Yeah, it's really amazing good. job. Yeah. Um, but that's it, right? Yeah. And then there's obviously no get the fuck out of here. <laughs> right. um, and then sometimes oh, we've had it before where you have um, people like the, didn't a couple. Do his background consent. <laughs> no, exactly. Himself. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where you'll get people who look great and then the person with the injury will go, yeah, I'll consent. And their mate or their wife or their husband will go, yeah, you can film me, but you can't hear me. And it's like, well, you don't know how TV works. We kind of need to hear you talk as well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, sure. and it's, so, you, yeah. so that doesn't kind of work. Although I've had, to, I've had to film situations like that. Right, okay. So just because there was literally nothing else going right. on. And it was to yeah. try and see if there was something you might use in, an, in a promo that might mm. be of use. So that's what happens in minors. In majors, the consent works in that you can, we can film 30 seconds of their face and then we can film the work of staff. So basically, when you get that shot, if you watch it, you know there's a shot where there's someone on a trolley and there's an overhead shot. That is part of the 30 seconds that you can take. So they'll, I will try and do two hits, which is one, when they come out of the ambulance, external to the hotel, uh, I was going to say the hotel. <laughs> external Some people say it like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, external to the hospital. So when they've literally come out of the ambulance, I'll try and get 30 seconds with mm. one of the, well, I'll try and get like 10, 15 seconds with one of the external cameras. Then when they come and they wheel through, I'll do the overhead shot to get another 15 seconds. Right. If I can't get any of those, I'll wait till they get into the bay and then get a 30 seconds there. Right. Yep. So we could just get an identifiable shot. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the kind of, of accident it is, you will either, and whether or not they've got um, friends, family that you can talk to to get consent, or you have to talk to um, the staff, because sometimes they can make a call. They will be able to say, because they know how the show works, they know what we want. They will basically take the call as to whether or not they think it's suitable, whether mm -hmm. it's right for us. So things can look far worse than they actually are. Right. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So they will go, it looks like, like someone comes in with a you know, impaled, and they'll go, it looks bad, but yeah, you can do it. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Right, okay. um, that's, an, <laughs> that's a really, you know, yeah, sure. you know, that's an extreme example, but that kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, and also um, staff, the staff have consent as well. Right, okay. So there is, yeah. and they, there's different levels for the staff. So there are some staff who are, anti 24 hours in a &E. They right. do not believe there should be cameras in a hospital. Right. Okay. They're there to work. So they do not want, they are yeah. very hospital. There is a woman I know for her from the back of her head. I can tell her from about 100 yards. And I would literally go, okay, X is in, cameras off her. Because she will go ballistic. She right. just doesn't want it. So you have to. Right. And okay. so if she's ever in a bay where I know I've got consent, I have to cut around her right, okay. because she does not want to be on screen. She does At not all, want to be right, nothing. No, okay. And so you'll have different levels. So there'll be full consent. They don't mind what you show. I've had consent where um, they don't mind you hearing their voice, mm -hmm. but don't want to see the face. So you can, do, you can hear them. You can see them working with their hands. Mm -hmm. And then there are, you know, so it's different stages and you kind of learn to know which doctors or nurses or staff will allow you to do whatever thing and also we've got a cheat sheet on the back of us so we can literally well, go I was going to say yeah because you're tracking a lot of information there is always a lot yeah. of information yeah. yeah which is why you have that you have to have that kind of camaraderie in the gallery right, and, okay. and get on really well with each other sure. it's really important because yeah. you know god forbid you're in there with somebody you don't like <laughs> and luckily that the garden pick people that we all get on with I, yeah. I, I'm going back for my fourth year I love it right okay yeah yeah Great. And how long is the shift doing it? How long are you doing so that intense? So that kind of is a six, uh, that's an eight hour shift. Right. Okay. Yeah. Solid. Pretty much, Pretty much solid. So it's right, not okay. like Big Brother in that you do two hours on an hour off. Right. Okay. Because the, the, with Big Brother, because they're crazy, the yeah, housework sure. is generally quite mental. Um, <laughs> and that's really not a good choice of words. They are not, they just do their own stuff. <laughs> sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it can get intense really yeah. quickly. Sure. Whereas with 24 hours in A&E, even in, when it's um, in majors, there's a lot of, they can be a lot of downtown right. and it's not so highly stressed. Sure. Although there are moments when it is particularly highly stressed, but it's sure. a lot different. And you can just pop out if you need to go to the loo or go and get stretch your legs or whatever. So you can, yeah. you're not chained to the desk. Right. Yeah. 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 Good. Any other 
Yeah. So, so they will have a separate team. So when, so once the patients have left, there is a group called patient liaison, and their job is to basically go back. Because what we have when we do those shows, 24 hours in A&E, those kind of shows, as opposed to Big Brother, is you have consent to film. So you've only got consent to film in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You haven't got consent to broadcast. Sure. So you have to go back, because obviously some people are distressed, so they might have said yes in the heat of the moment, right, and get yeah. home and then go, no, I don't want you to see me in a hospital gown looking like shit. Do you know what sure. I mean? Sure, yeah, no. Or Definitely. whatever I reason. I don't want that to happen. No, exactly. No. <laughs> so they might say no. Sure. So their yeah. job is to basically go back and assure them that we're not going to... And the nature of the show is we're not, it's a nice show. People get to tell their story. Mm -hmm. We're not there to stitch them up. No. So most people still can yeah. carry on the consent to consent to broadcast. Right. So it's their job to liaise with them. Then a separate team, producers and directors, will then go off and shoot those... Um, interviews right. with a machine which is name I cannot ever remember which is something like the automatron I want to say right which okay. is something like that so yeah. it's basically it's they've got it's like a normal camera but it has this screen that basically reflects to them the producer so it looks like they're looking at the producer when they're only just looking at a screen if that makes sense Oh, Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, Do you know how you have autocue? Yeah. You know yeah, yeah, autocue. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like autocue. So right. they so to get that shot of them looking down the barrel, sure. they get a reflection of the producer. Oh, really? So right, okay. yeah. Yeah. Apparently, this is what I'm told. Yeah. I've never, I don't do that. I'm not a single camera director, but yeah, there's sure. a special machine and thing. Okay. That, yeah. Yeah. Great. Was there another question over there? No. 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 Hey, was another question over here. I thought there was another question. There was a question. Oh, there is a question. I knew there oh, was a question. Yeah, well, you actually put your hand up <laughs> unconsciously. Um, so I was just wondering, um, because you said that contracts are quite important and having people know your name before you apply somewhere. But if, if this is not the case, you're in a completely new place and you want to apply somewhere, what would be something that you could add or you could do to just stand out? It is hard. I'm not gonna, well, and I hate using the word hard. I have to retrain myself. It is a challenge. You have to see it as a challenge. I think when I think words are really important in this context, and it's mm -hmm. something that I've had to really work on my own mindset. It's a challenge, and you've got to find your way. Like for me, my thing with the whole nine-page application, my thing was it's a challenge. I've got to find my way around it. That you are up. We have picked an industry which is oversubscribed. Sure. I'm just going to tell you that now. You are up against a thousand more of you. Okay, doing whatever roles you're going to be doing. And, you, and primarily, the way to get to people is via email. It just, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can use other social media, but essentially it is. So a lot of it is luck, if I'm going to be completely honest. Sure. And um, I think you have to do the emailing thing. So, you, like, your, so your emails, my thing would be to you is get what you have to say done inside five sentences or less. If you can't do it, you start again. You need to, because they haven't got time to read like the equivalent of War and Peace. Do you know what I mean? So you need to get to the point pretty quickly. You need to have your CV has to say everything it needs to say in a way that's easily readable um, and has, and I'm a real stickler for this, so I don't care if this is what, what we do here. If you have your CV, put referees on it. I see too many CVs which don't have referees details and contact details. Because you have to think about it. If I am a talent manager or a producer and I'm looking, I've got a runner size hole or a cameraman size, camera woman size hole that needs to be filled, right? Mm -hmm. If I get two CVs and one's got referees details, email address, a telephone number, and I've got another one which is just equally as good in terms of skills mm -hmm. and yeah. experience, doesn't have any details, who's probably going to get the job? The person I can call the quickest. Yeah. So please, for the love of God, put CVs, put your put references, references on your CV. Yeah, details. with contact yeah, details. Absolutely. The other thing is, is to then do face to face. So that is to network your ass off. Because, and, and also when you do that, leave a good impression so that if you get their details, you can go back and recount something that you discussed and put that in the header of your your um, email so that when they see it they can go like for instance on on um tuesday i went to bve mm -hmm. does anyone know bve 
Okay, start looking at those kind of expos. So BVE is basically a broadcasting expo where there is lots of talks about the industry and gaming, digital, film, cinematography, um, cameras, equipment. Um, there's another one, the BSC, so it's the British Society of Cinematographers. They had one probably about three weeks ago. Go to those things, meet people, talk to people on stalls. Even if you have no idea about what their cameras are, I'm, I'm not a camera person, I'm not <laughs> lenses, but I'll go and ask a question. Sure. Just because yeah. I want to learn. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And when you, so on Tuesday, I met, I was actually doing the emails to them today on the way here. About five really good people, two people potentially could be worth me, one in terms of my career, in terms of looking at other avenues and other genres. Mm -hmm. So it's good to I know this person, and I've when I when I talked to him, I wanted to basically he he does um, gaming and live events. So right. for, you know, if you're a gamer, you know we have these big sort of esports events. They multi camera direct those. I'm a multi camera director. I could do that. Um, uh, so I basically, I basically said, do you mind if I can, I can come and um, sit in the back of your gallery? Great. And so he now knows, we exchange num details. I, I know that, he, look, I'm, no disrespect, but I'm quite different from most directors, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, so I stand out. You kind of sure. have to find your way yeah, to stand yeah, sure. out. But yeah. I know that we had a particular conversation. So in my email to him, in the subject line, I put something that related to that. So when he sees that, he might not remember my name, but, but he'll remember yeah. what I we talked about. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's what I did with him. With another one, um, it was actually equipment that looks quite useful or could look quite useful for some shows that I could do in the future. And he's based in, he's from Denmark. So we had a chat. And we, he, he didn't, un there were certain British terms in terms of um, scripted TV and live events TV that he didn't know. So I taught him these words and right. I was like, I'll invoice you later. <laughs> uh, because I knew these words, he didn't know. He's trying sure. to explain these words. Yeah, yeah. So in the thing, in my body of the email, I said, I, I really enjoyed teaching you how to, you know, busking sure. and all these different words. Yeah. So he remembers who I am. Sure, yeah. So that's kind of, and it, it's, it's not an automatic help to solve that problem of yours. But it's, a f it's about working out what you can do when you meet people in real life, because you, that will, relationship will then have to be, well, it won't have to, but mostly will go back on, online mm -hmm. in the form of email. You will be in the email box with 30, 40, 50, 100 people just like you wanting a job potentially. You've got to stick out in some way. So you've got to convert that in real life moment into a relationship that will exist in email, but then will then relate, um, will then exist in real life again. Does sure. that kind of make it sense? Makes total sense. Yeah. So yeah, you've got absolutely. to find, you've got to find the hook. You've got to yeah. find a hook, and it's, yeah. it is. This industry is about whether we like it or not. It is about who you know to a degree, yeah. or who you get to know, or who like you get to, to know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's about who yeah. you get to know, yeah. and you, it's your job to do that. If you yeah. want to work, you know, I, you know, I yeah. don't have bank of mum and dad, so sure. I have to work. <laughs> sure. So that yeah. means I have to talk to people. Yeah. I have, and you never know where your connections will come from. No, definitely. Or you never know who knows who. So that's again goes back to being nice. You've got to be a nice person, you've got to be a good person, to you've got everybody. to have to be fun. You, you know what I mean? Absolutely. That's good. Um, another question over um, there, I see. What would you say were the key things to put on your business card apart from your details and your name? It depends at the level you're at. I don't know, obviously, your different skill sets and all that sort of stuff. I think um, <laughs> this is one, and I only say this because I did a panel for, uh, I do panels for like RTS, Ask Me Anything. They, yeah. So do you know, you know RTS? Yeah. Do you go to their careers fairs? Ooh. You should go because A, they're free, and B, especially if you're work, wanting to work, this is more for the TV, if you're in, I don't know. Actually, who, what is the split of the room? Are you more film? Are you, does everyone work in film? Who wants to work in film? Put your hands up. Um, who wants to work in documentary? Who wants to work in uh, TV drama? Entertainment. I bet no one, no one ever wants to work in entertainment. <laughs> you've, got, you've got one take. Oh, good, you. <laughs> you are going to do well. Um, uh, you, even if you don't want to work in... Well, actually, no. RTS thing is about all television. So if you work... They will have production companies from all different genres. Yeah.
So those things, are, I would wor it's worth signing up to because the RTS, they have this thing called um, RTS Futures and they do either free or low cost events yeah, for I young people. Yeah, we did them here in Bristol. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, we've had um, two students go when we've announced it before You that. need to go. Good. Good. Say it louder. You need to go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's probably loud. <laughs> that's possibly loud enough. Possibly loud enough. Maybe some of the students that are not here are hearing that as well, Good. which, is, which is not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, they, yeah, they, they do. Go. Good. Um, no, because yeah. you never know who you're going to meet. Absolutely. You never know who you're going to meet, and you'll get talent managers there. You might, if you're lucky, the odd producer will turn up, but you'll. It, they have CV classes. They will have people who will sit down and look at your CV, and people have a different way of dealing you'll have as many people in the room there will be as many different types of cvs that could be done yeah. but you'll at least you'll have someone who's in that profession who'll go okay yeah. probably isn't that out you know what i would do in terms of the outline but the things you're putting on there are great um you'll have different talks about the industry from people who are a bit more experienced than you you could possibly find someone who could mentor you i think it's you have to even if you aren't necessarily going to even if most of the things that are there on offer aren't necessarily the thing you want to do I would still go because you never know who people are and you never know who people know. It's a networking. You are going to have to, if you don't like networking, you're going to have to learn to fake liking networking because yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to network. Yeah, that absolutely. Is th that's yeah. the industry that we live in, unfortunately. It is. Until well, you get right. so you good. Meeting people, I don't think it's such a bad thing. Until, think, yeah, yeah. Until yeah. you get to the point where instead of you sending an email, someone's emailing or calling you, mm -hmm. you, you are going to have to do that. That's yeah. just going to be in part of your job. Yeah. It's one of those three things I said earlier. Yeah. That is the getting your job part of the job. Yeah. So you have to know how to do it. Yeah. So good. Yeah. All right, we haven't got long left. So any other questions before I've got last couple? No? Nothing? Anything? Mardi? Is there a question brewing there? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? What's the hardest thing you had to do in 24 hours? Oh, God, the hardest thing I had to do. What was the hardest thing I had to do? In terms of a story, do you mean? Covering a story or no, just physically? I don't know. I don't find it. I really love that. It's weird because I, I do multi camera directing, which is very different for fixed rig. I really love that job and I don't find it hard. I actually quite. I, for me, we, and this will probably sound quite weird. I see it as a game. It's a bit like a human game. Do you know what I mean? It's like when you do Big Brother. It's a bit like a human game. These people, I like to anticipate, I like watching people. I like body language. I like trying to work out dynamics and sure. all that sort of stuff. So my thing is, is knowing where to get that camera to get the shot that I want. And I treat it as a game, if that makes sense. So I, I don't find it particularly hard. It's in my head, it's a jigsaw puzzle that I just have to work out because tr just trying to get the right shots. Um, I, have, I haven't had, like, even, even seeing things that I thought I was going to get distressed, potentially distressed by, I wasn't necessarily distressed by them. I don't know whether part of that is, is my mum was a midwife. Right, so sure. I'm used yeah. to hearing stories of things that have happened in hospitals or do you know what I mean? Yeah, I've totally, been yeah, in that I'm world, so it doesn't well. affect me. Although injections, I, used to, I couldn't have just having an injection in my hand. I was just like, I can't do that. Now I can do it. Oh. I there was a thing they had two years ago. They were trying. To, there was an excess amount of blood in a in a very deep cut, and they had got I don't know what it's called, but these seashells, ground seashells, which were this pink color, like the the sea, like a, a prawn shell ground down and they put it into this person's leg and I was fascinated I thought this is amazing just right. different kind of technology right. wow. or just seeing I remember yeah it was I think it was last year it's about telling the story so there was someone had a cut another one a different cut on their leg and I was to the hotel operator going get deeper get closer get closer get closer because I wanted to see that cut <laughs> And then I had to start going, okay, I think I'll just calm down. Do you know what I mean? But I, because for me, that's part of the story. You want to see that thing. Sure. That's yeah. the reason why they're yeah. in and that's yeah. the reason why you're doing the story. Yeah. So there isn't anything in particular that I find difficult. Or I think part of it, the difficulty I have mostly is with the, and it's usually the guys, the guy directors next door, like last year, <laughs> we should be saying this. Um, <laughs> Someone had, it actually made a show last year, I think it was last year, 
someone had cut off the tops of their fingers and I was in the, so they were in majors, being covered in majors, and I was in the minors gallery and I don't think anything particular was happening, I think we were following the receptionist, there was literally nothing happened. And so the director, because you can talk to the, we've got a, yeah. um, a door in between us, but you can queue into the other the gallery. And so he buzzed in, he was like, Abigail, look at this banged on this shot on G, which is our shared screen, and there's this hand like that with blood going, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and we all just went, ah, yes. <laughs> and, they, and then, so we've all gone, in our, in our room, we've gone, ah, ah, and the next door they've heard us going, like, and they're all laughing, and they're pissing themselves laughing, because they hate, they've, the shock of seeing a hand going, ah, ah, with blood just pouring out. So you kind of, you have those moments. <laughs> but that's part of, that's part of, you know, you deal with stuff. I think sure. it's part of dealing with the stuff that you see. Yeah. You kind of need those light moments. Yeah. It's also like... What's it so like for the well, guy not, with the hand, Not for like, yeah. he survived, he was <laughs> fine. But do you know, it's... <laughs> but you, you kind of, and that's about, you know, you, you're on a job with yeah. people. Yeah. You need to have something that brings you together. And even if it's in those... I've done, you know, like doing the Olympics, you have those times when it's shit is going to the fan and you need something that's going to keep you going, keep you going together. Sure. And you just, it, otherwise it's just a job that doesn't mean anything to you. I don't yeah. know, you, yeah. you're in, we're in, this, we're in this world, we've chosen these worlds for a reason. And I think part of that reason is you want to have people who are good as you, having as much fun as you, sure producing good work yeah. that's what i want to yeah. do so yeah. I kind of, yeah, no, that's yeah that's good and so my last question then is what yeah what do you want next what's your what's your aspiration what's it yeah what would be i yeah, would the love dream job? the dream job is <laughs> means nothing to you because none of you except for you want to do entertainment <laughs> but <laughs> you might have all changed their mind by the <laughs> don't end think they have not with, <laughs> not with me as an example i want to no. go and do it <laughs> um, good. um i would like to, i would love to do and this is where it's so extreme, it's never going to happen, but this is my thing I'm aiming for. I would love to do half time at the Super Bowl with the Beyonce of the day, because it's probably going to be years before I do it. But you know, I would yeah. love to do, to put on that spectacle, knowing that you've got, I don't know how big their stadium's part, probably 80,000 80, people in the stadium, and a good couple of million watching, yeah. you know, or billion watching the show. Because I just love that live event and you've got i don't know 50 cameras on it and you've got a cast of god knows how many yeah. and it's live and it's got to happen and everyone's going to hit the nail and at the same time and it yeah. could go wrong and it could it's the yeah. it's, it's that the could little go wrong. bit it's the exciting it's bit the, isn't it it is it is <laughs> this is the bit that where you go oh we made it <laughs> do you know what i mean it's like yeah. eh, couldn't have worked but we did it well, it's that real <laughs> Because it's that's good. It's I've got absolutely no doubt you're going to end up doing that. <laughs> <coughs> uh, yeah, no, absolutely. That was absolutely brilliant. So let's, yeah, give. Uh, Thank you. That was so good. Thanks for coming to see us. And did it make to... sense, or was I just? Because from where <laughs> I am, I'm just Super babbling. And uh, <coughs> yeah. So, don't feel like you've got to dash off. Cool. Some of them might want to come and ask you questions they were too scared to ask in front of everyone else. If that's right. All right, if you are, no, seriously, yeah. if you've got a question, you can't be scared. If you're in the wrong <laughs> industry, seriously, <laughs> you cannot. You can't be scared. Uh, well, I agree, yeah. You've got but, to. But, but they are still a little no, bit, practice, some of them, some of the time. Practice on me. <laughs> we're in a safe place. Do you know what I mean? You can't, you've got to, seriously. Agreed, no, agreed. It's, it's part of the whole thing about, you know, just even networking. And then know it, uh, listen. I'm a person, I was not like, I oh know, really, I hate doing that. Listen. <laughs> I know you're listening. Listen. Um, sorry, I'm really no, no, <laughs> um, I wasn't, I didn't come out of the womb like this, believe me. I was really quite quiet and quite shy. Sure. Um, but I kind of realised that I felt, well, I kind of realised that I felt I was holding, something was holding me back and yep. that thing was me and I had to change it. And I... I knew I wanted to do things and get into worlds that I didn't know anybody was in my family was interested sure. in, yeah. or I knew anybody who had done those things. And I had to, if, if I wanted to pursue them, I had to go out and ask questions. I had to go and talk to people. I went to the point of, I bought books on fucking networking. 
Sure. Seriously, yeah, just yeah. to learn That's how to do it. Yeah. Because there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't any other way of learning how to sure. do it. So yeah. I'm not, I, I, you know, yeah. I don't mind telling anybody <laughs> because I think people need to know. Yeah. Not everyone has all the answers. No one has all the answers. Completely. And so yeah. your job is, if this is what you want to do, you kind of have to kind of, the best thing I think happens out just that little bit outside your comfort zone yeah that's where the magic happens yeah. is when you stretch yourself yeah you just have to be wary of stretching yourself way too far mm -hmm. because sometimes that scares you yeah. and you go oh, i'm not gonna do that again but you go if you scare yourself a little bit then and you then succeed you can then go Shit, i did that yeah i did that yeah. i worked that out i know yeah. how to do it now yeah I did it on sun Sunday. I went boy cycling with my boyfriend. He'd like cycling, and I'm like, oh, the these pedals—not the pedals, the the, um, the seats right. are so up your ass. You're just like, oh my god! <laughs> but he, he took me down this hill, and he's like, Abigail, you're going to go down this hill. Keep going. Don't stop. And it was, and I was like, it was a hill. I'm going down. It goes, no, but you have to keep going because you need that momentum to go down because you're going to go up again. Right. So you can't stop. He said, you can't stop. Don't stop. And I'm like, and I can see this hill. And I'm literally going, I can do this. I can do this. God, I can do this. I'm not a believer. God, I can do this. God, I can do this. God, I can do this. I literally did it. So I went down and back up again. And I came off the other side. I was like, I did that. I did that. And it's that bit where you just go, I know I can ride a bike. I've been down a hill again and before. I know I could probably get up again if I try. And you just keep going. Yeah. And I think that's the bit where I think the magic is. So you can't be too, yes, you can have those fears. Try and get someone, find your tribe to talk to about those things, but just go off and do it. You've got to try. Brilliant. So if you do ask Abigail a question <laughs> afterwards, expect to be shouted at for not asking it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that bad. Anyway, the next, uh, yeah, the top of the hill is the Super Bowl, I'm sure. Oh. So one more round of applause for Abigail. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, well, I hope, I hope you're going to take away some of these things that we talked about.